and it appears that we are live. Great. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to another session of our Sussex Vision Seminar Series, as always within the Worldwide Neuro Initiative, and this time together with the Leverhulme Doctoral Program from Sensation and Perception to Awareness. I'm George Cafetzis, a master graduate from Thomas Euler's lab and currently a PhD student with Tom Baden. And as your host for today, I would like to once again begin by thanking Tim Vogels and Panos Bozelos for putting forward this ever-expanding initiative towards a greener and much more accessible seminar world. Having said that, allow me, of course, to get back to the reason we all gathered here for today and introduce our guest from Caltech, Professor Markus Meister. Markus studied physics at the Technische Universität in Munich before moving to US and Caltech for his PhD on bacterial motion under the supervision of Howard Berg. Following postdoctoral years at Stanford, Marcus started as a professor at Harvard before returning in 2012, if I'm not mistaken, at Caltech, where he has been located ever since, and nowadays holding the title of Anne and Benjamin Giagini, Professor of Biological Sciences. In his uh, own words, it was only during his postdoc years at Stanford, working with Dennis Baylor, that he was introduced to the beauties and mysteries of the retina. And uh, thanks to his work, much of what was a mystery back then is no longer one. Most importantly, Marcus pioneered the use of uh, multi-electrode arrays for high throughput recordings of the retina's output. And uh, throughout the years, work from his lab has provided crucial insights on uh, different aspects of retina structure and function, from uh, retinal waves during development to signaling pathways within the retina, and to neural codes found in the timing, precision, and latency of spikes at the population level, Marcus has definitely done his fair part in showing that the eye is much smarter than what was traditionally thought. Uh, naturally, his uh, research interests expanded to the next level of uh, visual processing and the computations performed therein, uh, namely at the superior colliculus. And more recently, he has been approaching both from a behavioral and a theoretical perspective, the phenomena of learning in animals with his most uh, recent work entitled uh, Learning Fast and Slow, appearing on the archive platform just two days ago. Uh, but enough with my part, I'm more than elated to be having Marcus uh, here virtually with us for a big picture talk entitled The Standard Model of the Retina. So without any further ado from uh, my side, Please all welcome Professor Meister. Marcus, the stage is officially all yours. Uh, great. Uh, thank you, George. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we're good to go. Okay, super. Um, yeah, hello, everyone. And uh, thanks to uh, George and Tom and uh, uh, everyone at Worldwide Neuro for this uh, invitation. It's exciting to be on this forum. Um, I think it's a wonderful innovation for uh, getting people together, especially in a time when traveling is so complicated. Um, anyway, well, how did I pick the, the topic for this talk? I recently had an unusually interesting experience with peer review. Uh, I was asked to review a new paper along with uh, two other people. And uh, independently, all the three reviewers wrote something like, uh, this is very exciting. It's a new phenomenon of early vision. It's definitely worth publishing. On the other hand, uh, everything about it is expected from the standard model we have of how the retina works. And then the three reviewers independently went on to explain how, in their mind at least, uh, the existing understanding of the retina would predict the reported phenomena, not only qualitatively, but in quantitative detail. So I, I realized then that there exists, at least in the minds of uh, several scientists, a standard picture of how the retina works. Uh, and second, that the standard model is sufficiently powerful to not only fit the past observations on which it was based, but even to predict phenomena that haven't even been reported yet. And it's a model that offers us connections all the way from single neurons to human perception. Now, compared to many other areas of brain science, I believe that our understanding of the retina has reached an unusually advanced and satisfying state. And so my goal today is to summarize what I think that standard model is. And uh, I also wanna explore what were the fortunate conditions that allowed the community to come to the state of understanding and then I'll obviously also point to some missing ingredients. And towards the end, 
we could discuss how one might translate some of these lessons to understanding other parts of the brain. Now, I wanna make uh, a couple of caveats up front. Uh, first, this is a review talk. It's about the accomplishments from the entire research community. I'm going to illustrate it with some concrete examples. And yes, those slides are going to have links to specific articles on them, but whether or not any particular paper appears on those links has no relevance. Uh, this has very much been a community effort, and obviously I can review only some parts of it. And second, I'm not going to claim that everything is understood about the retina, even in the so restricted domain of visual processing. There are many open questions that remain. On the other hand, I feel like the research questions that we are asking now are much more sophisticated than is commonly discussed in other areas of brain science. Someone used to say, someone said once, um, no, we used to just be confused, but now we're confused on a much higher level. And I feel like that's the state of uh, advance in this uh, research field. Anyway, I've been told that uh, this uh, seminar may be infiltrated by people who are not vision specialists. And uh, if that's uh, correct, I'm very happy about it. But uh, just to get everyone on the same page, uh, the talk is going to be about early visual processing implemented by the retina in the eye. The rest of the eye serves as a camera using the cornea and the aperture of the pupil and the lens to project an image onto the back of the eye. That's where the retina resides, a layered neural tissue that uh, has the job of converting light into neural signals to then start filtering those signals from the photoreceptors through the uh, various layers of neurons to ultimately the retinal ganglion cells. The ganglion cells are the output neurons of the retina. Each of these neurons has an axon, an optic nerve fiber, and the collection of those optic nerve fibers sends signals to the brain. The action potentials of retinal ganglion cells are the only thing the brain knows about the visual world. Uh, everything else downstream is based on those spike trains. Okay, so what uh, is the standard model? Uh, let me start with some basic premises. Um, I, when I was in college, I learned quantum mechanics from a book that took a totally axiomatic approach. Uh, the book sort of laid out the four axioms of quantum mechanics, and then the rest of the book just derived all the phenomenology from those axioms. Uh, I think that's a fantastic ideal to aspire to. I'm not sure we're, <laughs> we're, we're quite there in, in neuroscience. But uh, nevertheless, I tried to lay out what are like some four premises that uh, we believe, uh, uh, and then we'll flesh those premises out in the form of uh, what I think is the standard model of the retina. The first is there's a pretty clear conception of what the purpose is of the retina. Its job is to make light visible. It, uh, uh, the processing in the retina accounts for a lot of basic aspects of our visual perception, and I'll give some examples in a moment. So given that, what's the goal of the standard model? It's to explain and predict the responses of retinal ganglion cells, which are the output neurons of the retina, as a function of visual patterns on the photoreceptors. If we can accomplish that, then we've captured to some extent the contribution that the retina makes to human vision. Another premise, there seem to be about 30 or 40 types of retinal ganglion cells. So uh, I'm not saying there's 30 or 40 of these neurons, there are 30 or 40 types of these neurons. In the human retina, there's a million of these neurons total. Each of these types is the output of a circuit that leads all the way from the photoreceptors to the retinal ganglion cell. And different types of retinal ganglion cells are distinct by exactly what that circuit looks like, the parameters of the circuit model, and I'll go into some detail about what that is. And finally, um, retinal neuroscience has benefited a lot from comparison across species. Different species have retinas that look very much alike, but they differ from each other in the types of responses that you find or that predominate in the retinal ganglion cells. And these types of responses, again, can be summarized by certain parameters of the circuit model. And the thought is that different species have undergone a different selection for these parameters as a result of evolutionary pressure and ecological niches. Uh, 
Okay, let me start by, um, let's say, this premise number one, that retinal processing accounts for basic aspects of visual perception. And just uh, for background, give you some, remind you of some things that we know in this area. So, uh, <clears throat> very basic question. Um, how visible is light of different wavelengths? And uh, there is a long history to uh, investigations of this, this problem. And here is a result that was published a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> in uh, yellow, the data points are the visibility of light as a function of wavelength. So in practice, you have a human subject sitting in a dark room and you produce flashes of different wavelengths of light and you ask, did you see it or did you not see it? And you make the flash dimmer and dimmer until they stop seeing it. And here is the sensitivity as a result. And obviously it looks like we're very sensitive to light of 500 nanometers and somewhat less sensitive to light of 450 or to light of 550, and then things tail off beyond that. Now there's a second set of data points here, the blue ones, and these are biophysical measurement of the absorption spectrum of rhodopsin. So you isolate rhodopsin from the retina, put it in a cuvette, shoot light through it of different wavelengths and ask how much light comes out the other end of the cuvette, and this is the result in blue. And obviously you can see that the, the points lie right on top of each other. And uh, <clears throat> more or less everything about the, the human spectral sensitivity is explained by the biophysical properties of one molecule, rhodopsin. So I think this stands as kind of an ideal of scientific reduction that uh, one might want to aspire to. So if there are other aspects of human vision that we can reduce to elementary, molecular, cellular, or circuit properties to the level of precision of this example, then we'd be very happy. Okay, let's get a little more complex. Um, how visible is light of different spatial patterns? Again, this experiment has a long history. You show a human subject spatial patterns like the sinusoid gratings that can be either very coarse or very fine. And then you ask again, did you see it or did you not see it? and you plot the visibility of the grating as a function of spatial frequency. And that's shown in these curves. In bright light, you find that we're most sensitive to light of about five cycles per degree, meaning there are five of these fringes per degree of visual angle. Just to remind you, a degree of visual angle is roughly the size of your thumb when you hold it out. Um, <clears throat> so we're most sensitive to about five zebra stripes on your thumb, and uh, we are less sensitive to uh, uh, both coarser patterns, which is interesting, but uh, and finer patterns. In uh, dim light, the situation changes somewhat. Uh, they, we are less and less sensitive, of course, to uh, seeing patterns of light, and it becomes more of a, a low-pass kind of relationship, meaning we're most sensitive to the coarsest patterns. Uh, here's the equivalent measurement for, from a neuron in the early visual system of the macaque. Uh, this is a neuron in the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, but for all intents and purposes, uh, retinal ganglion cells behave the same way. And again, you can plot here the sensitivity of the neuron, namely does it change its response as a function of the uh, spatial frequency of the grating. And again, you find this kind of band pass relationship where there's a, sense, uh, a maximum around five cycles per degree and then the sensitivity trails off on both sides. And a good number of experiments of this type suggest that this basic aspect of human vision, uh, contrast sensitivity to different frequencies, is essentially explained by retinal processing because we see the same relationship in the retinal gang cells. You can ask the same question about temporal patterns. So now the light flickers in time rather than being sinusoid in space, it's sinusoid in time. And you can ask as human subject, can you see it or not see it? And here's the sensitivity curve to the light of different flicker frequencies. It looks like we're most sensitive to light that flickers at about 10 Hertz and then less sensitive to very rapid flicker, but interestingly also less sensitive to slower flicker. So there's sort of an optimum of temporal variation that the humans are, are uh, sensitive to. And again, you can do that same experiment with the output of the retina, and you find a similar relationship, uh, bandpass relationship for flicker frequencies. And uh, as in the spatial case, if you go from bright light to dim light, the relationship shifts to the left. Okay, so these are some examples 
how aspects, basic aspects of uh, human vision can be explained by the output of the retina. And that really motivates why one wants to understand uh, how the retina works. Uh, if we can explain how you go, how nature goes from visual signals and photoreceptors to the output of retinal ganglion cells, then we've captured at least these basic elements of uh, human vision. Okay, um, so what are the ingredients of, of that standard model? So we can take inspiration from other standard models in science. I mean, for example, the standard model of particle physics, which I understand at the level of popular science magazines. Um, but uh, <laughs> at that level, uh, <clears throat> the standard model specifies what are the uh, components of matter, you know, and, and uh, so the, uh, what are the basic particles uh, and what are the forces between those particles and the interactions and how can we, given the particles and their interactions, explain the emergence of bigger things like, you know, the nuclei of atoms or people ultimately. So similarly here, uh, we're gonna start with what are the particles, what are the components of the retina and then what are their interactions and then how can we put the particles and interactions together to explain something like circuit function? Okay, the components in the case of a neural system are the cell types, the, the different types of neurons. And uh, in the retina, there seem to be about 100 types of neuron, 100 component types. I like to say it's a little bit like the complexity of a radio, if you, or at least an old-fashioned radio. If you break it open and spill it out on the table, you'll find about a hundred different kinds of parts. Um, so traditionally the cell types were defined by their shape. And here's a graphic representation of that, uh, photoreceptors, horizontal cells, typically two or three types, bipolar cells, maybe a dozen types, amacron cells, maybe 30 types, ganglion cells, 30 to 40 types. And uh, again, the traditional distinction was by uh, anatomy, looking under the microscope at the shapes of these neurons, they really have dramatically different shapes in many cases. So that already serves to kind of distinguish them from each other. In recent years, we've also been able to identify these cell types by their uh, gene expression patterns, uh, either using distinct molecular markers or uh, more recently through single cell RNA sequencing, uh, identifying more or less uh, you know, the entire gene expression profile. And then <clears throat> these uh, cells fall into clusters based on their transcriptome. And these clusters, it turns out, can be identified more or less one-to-one -one with uh, cell types that were previously defined based mostly on the shape. Now, um, a number of you are probably wrinkling up their noses because I would say both anatomy and uh, single cell RNA sequencing are very much um, forms of art uh, in the sense that uh, the classification that you arrive at is to some extent in the eye of the beholder. I mean, anatomists are famous for you know, seeing multiple types uh, among the uh, items that they, uh, that they inspect under the microscope. But similarly, uh, single cell RNA-seq is not a precise science. And uh, depending on how you set the parameters of the analysis, you might find more or fewer clusters in these gene expression patterns. So there's something remarkable about uh, cell typing in the retina in that uh, we actually have a separate criterion that tells us uh, when we've identified a natural cell type, uh, maybe a, a type that nature believes is a cell type. And this criterion has to do with the spatial arrangement of the neurons on the retina. Uh, here's an example. This is a, a face view of uh, the retina with a certain cell type labeled in red. These are so-called starburst amacron cells. And you can see that these cell bodies of these neurons are spaced more or less regularly apart. It's not the beautiful square lattice or anything, but there is a clear sense in which the uh, cell bodies tend to avoid each other. They keep at a certain distance from each other. Now, you might not uh, believe that from just staring at this uh, uh, one micrograph, but if you analyze the distribution of these cell bodies relative to each other, uh, you can plot the probability of finding a neuron as a function of distance from another neuron of the same class. 
and you find that uh, there is this distinct hole at short distances, uh, meaning that there are far fewer neurons near another neuron than you expect by chance. Yeah, so if we had, had sprinkled the cell bodies onto the retina like rain, you know, independently of each other, uh, this uh, curve should be a constant. The probability of finding another neuron as a function of distance should be uh, constant. Instead, there is this uh, dip at short uh, distances. Um, I expand on this a little bit because it, I think, is a very important um, benefit that uh, we have uh, enjoyed in studying the retina, that these uh, cell types are actually certified uh, in this way. If you uh, look at the relative relationship of two different cell types, let's say um, a starburst amacrine cell and a different type of amacrine cell, they do not have this repulsion. And so that uh, tells you that nature considers these two different types. They are, uh, uh, they are sort of certified <laughs> by biology as, uh, as the cell types. The purpose of this, of course, underlying purpose is likely that uh, uh, retinal development spaces these neurons apart so that every point on the retina is close to one neuron of that type and you don't get sort of accidental clustering and holes in the distribution in order to perfectly cover the visual space with all of the elements that are necessary for visual processing. Okay, so much about cell types. What about the connections between cell types? So here again, there is a lot of order, there's a lot of structure in how the retina is organized. Uh, so at the coarsest level, the retina consists of five layers. There are three cellular label layers, the outer nuclear, uh, the uh, photoreceptor layer, the uh, uh, retinal ganglion cell layer, and the uh, inner nuclear layer. And uh, they are separated by two layers of synapses. And uh, these, uh, uh, this alternation between cellular layers and synapse layers pretty much constrains the connectivity of the major types of neuron in the retina. So photoreceptors connect to bipolar cells, but not to ganglion cells, and bipolar cells connect to ganglion cells, but not back to photoreceptors. And uh, so the five major classes of neurons are restricted in how they connect to each other just by the layering of their organization in the retina. Actually, the layering is much more precise. So uh, there is this uh, big synaptic layer called the inner plexiform layer. It's about uh, 40 or 50 microns in thickness. And uh, it is purely synapses. It's just uh, dendrites and axons of the neurons connecting to each other. And uh, within that inner plexiform layer, there's a lot of structure, uh, individual types of neurons will ramify the dendrites in just a very thin lamina of this inner plexiform layer. Uh, to be precise, these lamina can be only like one micron in thickness. Uh, so there is, there are probably on the order of uh, 40 perhaps different laminae in this inner plexiform layer. And neurons that uh, ramify within the same lamina will be able to make synapses with each other. But if they're in different laminae, they're just not in the kind of proximity needed to make a synaptic connection. So this inner plexiform layer and this laminar organization really specifies which neurons are allowed to connect to each other and which ones don't. Now within that constraint, there is still a good number of possible partners that might form and which partners actually make synapses is determined by certain cell surface proteins that uh, make two membranes stick to each other or not, or determine whether a synapse gets formed or not. And in recent years, there's been a lot of insight into the nature of these uh, cell surface molecules. They often come in families with a combinatorial diversity like the D-scans and the protocadherins. And the rules by which they adhere to each other will specify which neurons form a synapse and which ones don't. And so, for example, we have a pretty good understanding for the molecular determinants of uh, this particular circuit that leads uh, from bipolar cells all the way to this uh, direction-selective ganglion cells. And the molecules involved in forming some of these connections or constraining them at least uh, have, uh, have been identified to some degree already. Okay, so we know something about cell types and something about the interactions between cell types. And of course, from that come neural circuits. Um, and uh, 
the constraints on the connectivity uh, really lead to constraints on uh, what kinds of neural circuits you find in the retina. But there's still a good amount of diversity that fits within those uh, constraints on synaptic connectivity. And uh, <clears throat> so generally speaking, each ganglion cell has uh, above it a circuit that leads all the way from the photoreceptors down to the ganglion cell neuron. And uh, these circuits have to satisfy the constraints on synaptic connectivity that I mentioned. And here are a few of the motifs that we find in these uh, circuits. Uh, one common motif that, of course, you find elsewhere in the nervous system or more or less anywhere is uh, pooling, where multiple neurons pool their signals into one place, like the multiple cone photoreceptors uh, get pooled by a uh, large field bipolar cell. Uh, an interesting motif very early in the retina is uh, pathway splitting. So the uh, cone signal immediately splits into uh, the on bipolars and off bipolars. The on bipolars are excited by light and the off bipolars are uh, inhibited, hyperpolarized by light. Um, this is, uh, has interesting consequences really for the whole rest of retinal processing that the pathway splits very early on into uh, uh, pathways of opposite polarities. In particular, those opposite polarities can be processed independently and subsequently combined again in very interesting ways. Another uh, common motif is lateral inhibition. Uh, cone photoreceptors through horizontal cells can inhibit other cone photoreceptors. Um, bipolar cells through amacron cells can inhibit other bipolar cells. Uh, there's also feed-forward inhibition. Amacron cells in a feed-forward fashion inhibit retinal ganglion cells. These are all motifs that you find elsewhere in the, in the nervous system as well. A lot of interesting things happen. I mentioned this a moment ago through the reconvergence of pathways. So the early pathway splitting where you know, a cone talks to nine or 10 different types of, of bipolar cells. Ultimately, those signals can reconverge at the ganglion cells. And this leads to quite interesting computations. Um, I'll show some examples of that. Um, there are some key nonlinearities in, uh, in this uh, circuit. Uh, and it's important to point out the nonlinearities because if everything were just a, a, a linear summation, there wouldn't be much interest. Uh, there's not much you can compute, not much you can develop by just linearly combining signals from photoreceptors. So the key nonlinearities, I think, are uh, photoreceptors have a lot of gain control, uh, strong adaptation effects in photoreceptors. Uh, you also see gain control at synapses. For example, the uh, bipolar cell synapse has a, a good amount of short-term synaptic plasticity. Uh, important nonlinearity is rectification. Probably every neuron in the circuit has a nonlinear input-output function to some extent. Um, a lot of interesting neural computations can be explained by the nonlinearity at the bipolar output synapse. And what that means is that the depolarization releases neurotransmitter and hyperpolarization doesn't do very much. Um, and so the 40 different types of retinal ganglion cell are essentially characterized by 40 different kinds of circuits that lead to the output. And uh, you can parameterize those circuits in this uh, standard model by specifying, well, what, should the, what is the receptor type? Uh, rods or cones feeding the bipolar cell. Uh, what are the types of bipolar cells in that circuit? What uh, types of amacron cells do they feed? Uh, what's the degree of rectification at the bipolar cell output synapse? So these can be listed as parameters of a circuit model and then used to actually make predictions for how that circuit would work. So let me show you some uh, examples uh, of that. And first of all, it's, I, I want to give you a sense of how well the standard model works, right? So uh, um, I've uh, argued that uh, we have an understanding of uh, the, the retina that really helps to explain or predict phenomena at the level where it becomes interesting for understanding human vision. And uh, so what is that, that level of prediction really like? So here's an example of uh, trying to use a standard model to predict the output of the retina. We used here um, <clears throat> uh, movies from the real world and projected those movies onto the retina of a mouse. This movie was taken from a little video camera on top of the mouse. 
uh, this movie was taken by simulating a mouse with a roller skate, putting a video camera on a roller skate and running it through the grass uh, <clears throat> to try to you know, get the right pr perspective on the world. Anyway, we project that movie onto the retina in the laboratory and record the spike trains of a retinal ganglion cell. And here are responses to six identical repeats of the same movie. Uh, these are raster plots. So every tick mark is an action potential along the time axis, 10 seconds. And you can see that on subsequent repeats of the same movie, the scanning cell does very much the same thing. The firing rate goes up and down by a lot, you know, from, from 400 hertz to zero in a few uh, milliseconds. And so it's uh, very strongly modulated by what's happening in this movie. It's very reproducible. The little gray shadow here is the standard error around the average response. So there is a lot to be explained here. Um, uh, similarly, this other movie, the same retinal gang and cell produces uh, very strong variations in firing rates, again, with a high degree of reproducibility. Okay, so how well can we do in actually explaining this output of the retina? Now, here's an example. <clears throat> For this particular neuron, uh, we uh, write a circuit model uh, that uh, takes, uh, uh, assumes that light in the center of the receptive field is processed by a set of off bipolar cells light in the surround of the receptive field is processed again by off bipolar cells but then through a set of amacron cells the ganglion cell pulls these two signals from the center and the surround uh, and there's rectification at the bipolar cell output so it's a, it's it's a relatively simple circuit i'm sure it is, is oversimplified compared to what's actually there in in nature but it suffices to make a very good prediction. So here in green is the variation and firing rate of the neuron as a function of time that I showed you a moment ago. And in red is the prediction from the model after feeding the movie through the simple circuit. And the uh, red line and green line uh, are in pretty good correspondence. Uh, I'll say in a moment how good the correspondence is, but let me just, uh, make clear that this is not uh, an, an, an accident that only applies to the particular type of ganglion cell in the mouse. Here's a similar result from a macaque on and off parasol cell. So these, this is a major class of retinal ganglion cells in the primate retina. And again, the data and the output of a simple filter model like that are plotted on top of each other. And you can see that the correspondence is quite good. In fact, in both cases, the correspondence explains about 80% of the explainable variance. So explainable variance is the amount that the firing rate varies minus the noise in that, uh, in that measurement. So this is, to me, 80% is, <laughs> is a good result. Uh, but people definitely fall into optimists and pessimists uh, in, uh, in this regard. So, and sometimes the same research group will publish a paper where they celebrate 80% and then another paper where they complain that it's only 80% and how are we gonna understand the remaining 20%. Um, so, you know, we, we, we each can, can fall on the different parts of that spectrum. Uh, to me, the glass is 80% full and uh, I feel like this is a, it's, it's a real accomplishment if we can understand the spike trains at the output of the retina to 80% accuracy under the kinds of conditions that the retina works with in real visual life. Now, I know this is, uh, we're not as far along for all the types of retinal ganglion cell and maybe even all the types of uh, natural movies, but th there's a clear existence proof and kind of a path forward. And it uh, looks to me like uh, the standard model is going to, with sufficient elaboration, going to lead to this kind of 80% uh, understanding across the board of uh, the retinal cell types. Okay, uh, so far I've talked about the, just predicting the firing rate of neurons, but the, obviously retinal ganglion cells fire spikes. And uh, there's been a proposal at least that the precise timing of the spikes is important in signaling things to the brain. And it turns out you can, with a small enhancement of the standard model, you can predict individual spike times. The only thing you really have to do is uh, replace the retinal ganglion cell with an integrated fire model. Integrated fire model means that the input to the cell gets compared to a threshold. When it crosses a threshold, the neuron fires a spike and then resets the memory potential by a certain amount that decays exponentially. 
So <clears throat> this integrated fire model coupled to the input from bipolar and hemocrine cells and others uh, can make uh, quite realistic looking predictions of spike trains. So here's an example from a few different types of retinal ganglion cell of real spike trains under visual stimulation on top and uh, simulated spike trains from the model with the correct parameter settings on the bottom. And you know it becomes hard to tell which is which. Uh, the sense is that the model can really capture the output of the retina down to the timing of individual spikes and the variation in the number of spikes and so on. So I think, again, the substrate is there for making predictions down to a quite precise uh, level of resolution. So let's talk about some more exotic functions of the retina that go beyond uh, linear filtering. So <clears throat> here's an interesting phenomenon that's probably also connected somehow to human vision, which is a pattern adaptation. If you expose the retina for some period of time to uh, vertical bars, uh, the ganglion cells become less and less sensitive. Their activity declines by like a factor of two over 10 seconds or so. And if you then switch to horizontal bars, the ganglion cell, the same ganglion cell will jump back up to high firing rates and decline again over 10 seconds by a factor of two. And so there is this sort of stimulus specific pattern adaptation, which uh, has a direct parallel in human psychophysics. And uh, <clears throat> we've wondered for some time how that can be explained in, in retinal circuits. And the alternate theories have been proposed, and it looks like the one that's uh, winning out uh, today or as of a few years ago is uh, short term plasticity at the terminal of bipolar cells. It uh, turns out that individual bipolar cells can become selective for vertical or horizontal bars because of asymmetric inhibition from an amacron cell. And then if a bipolar cell is very active under that stimulus, it probably its vesicles get depleted, short-term short synaptic depression sets in, and the ganglion cell gets less and less input over time. Whereas uh, when the pattern switches to a different uh, orientation, a different set of terminals that is still at full strength now is active and it gradually depletes and becomes tired and leads to this uh, pattern adaptation. So the pattern adaptation used to be thought of as a mysterious phenomenon, I think fits uh, squarely into the standard model. Here's another interesting uh, phenomenon. This is a, a bias for approaching motion. This has been uh, reported in the uh, parasol cells of the macaque retina. Uh, if you take a sort of a random texture picture and uh, uh, enlarge it gradually, which uh, is similar to what might happen if the animal approaches the, te the texture, uh, these parasol cells fire uh, strong bursts of spikes, whereas uh, in the opposite motion, when the pattern recedes, uh, they, uh, uh, they hardly respond at all. So, uh, and this is true for both on cells and off cells, and it doesn't matter what the exact structure is of the texture. And uh, this incidentally was the paper that we reviewed <laughs> and uh, argued that uh, its predictions uh, or its uh, phenomena are predicted by the standard model. And in fact, uh, if you just take uh, a, a single ingredient of the standard model, namely the integration over nonlinear subunits, which are likely bipolar cells, you can predict that the output, the retinal ganglion cells, will respond more strongly to approaching motion than to receding motion. And there's a whole bunch of other you know, exotic uh, computations that the retina performs that similarly uh, can, explain, can be explained with the standard model circuit. Uh, there are certain retinal ganglion cells that are selective for the differential motion between an object and the background. And the circuit has been proposed for how that might work. And the circuit has been tested, in fact, by injecting current into these neurons and seeing that it has a proper effect on the output. Uh, a different kind of uh, looming uh, sensitivity has been traced again to a version of the standard circuit using these amacron cells as interposed neurons between bipolar and ganglion cells. Uh, I mentioned a moment ago that uh, <clears throat> there have been proposals for how spike timing might encode visual information that's of interest to the brain. And again, the uh, timing of specific spikes under different stimuli can predict it quite well, it can be predicted quite well by the standard model of uh, neural circuits. And other functions 
uh, more esoteric functions by which uh, retinal ganglion cells seem to switch between on and off type, depending on context, again, can be traced to uh, the circuitry that is uh, sustained by the standard model of the retina. So the sense is that uh, uh, we, we are really doing quite well in uh, not only explaining phenomena that have been observed, but even in trying to predict phenomena that uh, we don't even know about yet. Uh, that's actually a, a branch that hasn't been exploited enough, I think. Uh, <laughs> I think it would be worth uh, working through what are some possible predictions that haven't even been tested yet uh, experimentally. And uh, that's, uh, I think, would be a, a great rotation project for students in your laboratories. <clears throat> okay, um, let me move on a bit and uh, summarize, uh, like, why do we think that retinal neuroscience has come to the state of affairs where the important aspects of neural function can be captured at least to like 80% accuracy? Um, so here are some ingredients of success that uh, we've already talked about. There's a pretty clarity of purpose of the retina. You know, it's there to process light. It's not doesn't have to do with hunger uh, or or uh, you know memory, uh, and and so we can pretty clearly say that it's involved in these uh, functions that have to do with the you know processing visual patterns. Uh, whereas if you're working you know somewhere deep in the brain in the hippocampus, uh, you know there is no clarity of purpose for what that uh, what that structure does for the animal. Uh, there's a really close link to psychophysics. Uh, we've talked about it already, but well, for literally hundreds of years, people have experimented on their own visual system, and uh, there are some fantastic visual illusions that illustrate some of the oddities of vision, and you can replicate them in the retina. And so this uh, close connection to uh, visual psychophysics, I think, has made a big difference, especially in guidance, like what problem do you actually want to understand? We talked about cell types, in particular cell types that are certified by nature, that's important. We talked about the structured connectivity that comes from the beautiful layering of uh, cells and synapses in the retina. Um, experimental access, this is a, an important one. You can take the retina out of the eye, put it in a dish, and it works. It may not work exactly the way it does in the eye, but it works. So a lot of the basic circuit functions are there, and you can study them, and you can then go back and verify them in vivo and uh, make sure that uh, this also happens in the eye. Uh, of course, taking the retina out into the dish uh, gives you fantastic access uh, for, with sharp electrodes and electrode arrays and pharmacology and calcium imaging and, and whatnot. Uh, so uh, the, the, the access has been uh, fantastic. Another thing I'd like to say is that uh, the retina is naturally optogenetic. Uh, you know, many of our colleagues are struggling to make neurons respond to light so that they can you know, inject signals into their neural circuit of choice. Uh, the cone photoreceptors come with the opsin built in already. And so you can stimulate 100,000 of the input neurons with pixels of light on your monitor. Uh, and this sort of level of resolution of stimulating the input to the network is really hard to attain otherwise. And finally, I touched on this, but I think it's very important. This sort of uh, cross-species integration of the discipline. Uh, you know, and 100 years ago, Lord Arian started recording from eel eyes, and you know, already you know, reported some of the phenomena we uh, are still interested in today. Uh, <clears throat> subsequently, you know, cats and uh, and uh, monkeys and uh, frogs and toads and turtles and uh, salamanders. <laughs> And uh, more recently, it's been popular to focus on the mouse retina, but it's important that uh, a lot of this cross-species work has shown how reproducible the basic principles are across species. And, uh, and that has really been allowed us to focus on the important aspects of uh, retinal processing. I should say <clears throat> by cross-species, I would include invertebrates. Uh, it's kind of remarkable how similar some of the retinal processing is in uh, flies and, uh, and mammals. And uh, this is just one example of the review paper that illustrates this for the case of uh, motion computation. In both uh, flies and, and mammals, you find uh, four classes of neurons that respond to motion along the cardinal axes. And uh, 
the way these things are computed is actually quite similar uh, in the in the two uh, the two cases. Now these are you know hundreds of millions of years of evolution apart. They obviously developed independently of each other, uh, and uh, it's interesting to see how nature struck on a very similar algorithm for computing uh, directional motion information uh, about the image. Okay, I also want to uh, point to some uh, things that were not necessary for uh, success in understanding the retina. <clears throat> and um, oscillations. So, <laughs> very popular meme in uh, brain science that uh, neurons communicate with each other, or brain errors communicate by oscillating. <clears throat> I remember when I was a young assistant professor, I visited a senior person at another institution who <clears throat> proceeded to explain that obviously the retina is just a series of coupled oscillators. I mean, just look at it, right? So, you know, the neurons are organized in the plane and uh, uh, each neuron is an oscillator and you just have to figure out how they're coupled to each other and that will explain the retina. So this was very much a sort of engineering mindset that uh, uh, yeah, visual images are translation invariant. Uh, the eigenfunctions of the translation operator are sinusoids, and therefore, obviously, a uh, visual system should uh, perform Fourier transforms and oscillate. Um, so, one thing we can say uh, quite certainly, I think, uh, 30 years later, is that the, uh, that's not the case. Uh, there's no sense in which the retina performs a Fourier transform. There's no sense in which it uh, operates or signals as a set of coupled oscillators. Um, now, there was a brief scare in the 1990s when uh, <coughs> a, a number of uh, high profile articles reported that uh, neurons in the visual cortex of the cat were oscillating at precise frequencies. And in fact, the different neurons were oscillating at different frequencies. And the claim was that uh, this uh, solves the binding problem, that uh, different parts of an object are identified by the same oscillation frequency, and a different object would oscillate at a different frequency. And that's how downstream parts of the brain know that uh, the parts of the object belong together, because they're all oscillating at 91 hertz. And then subsequent high-profile papers trace the oscillation into the lateral geniculate nucleus, and eventually to the retina. And in this report here, there were you know, electrodes simultaneously in the retina, the thalamus, and the cortex. And they all oscillated at 91 hertz and with incredible precision. Um, <clears throat> so um, at that point, the retina community sort of raised its head and said, well, look, uh, you know, we've had literally thousands of reports of uh, uh, responses of retinal ganglion cells and a tiny minority of them has reported any kind of oscillation and none of them has reported uh, you know perfect uh, synchrony at 91 hertz um so what's going on here and i think in the meantime we now acknowledge that the, these uh, oscillations were an artifact of anesthesia and uh, we just don't anesthetize uh, neural circuits anymore when trying to understand how they work and uh it's remarkable to me actually how robust the retina is to oscillations. Like nature seems to go out of its way to stop it from oscillating. Uh, you might think that a circuit that has a large gain, like you know, photoreceptors with uh, gains of a million or so, uh, and, and feedback loops, a circuit like that would be prone to oscillating, but actually it, it's hard to make the retina ring at all. You can do it with incredibly strong flashes of light. Uh, you can get a few oscillation cycles. But uh, it seems like the system is designed to be overdamped <laughs> so that it doesn't oscillate. Um, another ingredient that I would argue was not necessary for understanding the retina, at least so far, is sort of full-blown compartmental modeling of neurons. Now, you've all seen models like this where the neuron gets divided into 100 or even 1,000 compartments. And each compartment has its own hodgkin huxley equations with separate memory and conductances, and they're coupled to each other. And then you have to use a supercomputer to understand even how the single neuron works. Um, the model will have hundreds of parameters. Many of the parameters are unknowable, or at least unknown uh, to science at the moment. And so 
it gets very complex at the single neuron level. Uh, I would argue that we haven't needed that uh, level of complexity. Uh, most of the neurons in the models that people draw and calculate through are point neurons, meaning they integrate their synaptic inputs and they produce a synaptic output as a result with no uh, local nonlinearities. There are a few cases where we need to divide the neuron into two or more compartments. So for example, the bipolar cell soma and the bipolar cell terminal have different voltages. Uh, it comes about because the terminal gets input from amacron cells, for example, and that uh, inhibition does not travel all the way back up the axon to the bipolar cell soma. So the bipolar cell you know, needs to be divided into a couple or, or more compartments. Uh, similarly, the starburst amacron cell, it's a very cool neuron that has a lot of uh, processing happening within its dendrites. Uh, in particular, the dendrites are sensitive to object motion that goes outward rather than inward. And uh, each dendrite seems to be doing that computation independently of the others. So the starburst amacron cell is another case where it's reasonable to divide the neuron into four or five compartments and consider them separately. Um, but I would say that the degree of single neuron biophysics that uh, has been necessary, at least so far, is uh, relatively modest uh, compared to the sort of full, full blown compartmental modeling that you see in some other studies of uh, in brain science. Um, here's another uh, theme that is very popular in uh, neuroscience these days, so low dimensional dynamics, right? And <clears throat> the idea is, um, uh, you know, why does the brain have the millions and, and billions of neurons? Well, maybe uh, it's all organized in a very inefficient way so that uh, the million neurons are encoding uh, just two or three important variables. Uh, and uh, so projecting the activity of all the neurons that we record onto uh, principal components, one can then draw these trajectories in a low dimensional space uh, to try and summarize the overall neural activity in the circuit. And, uh, but people go beyond just uh, using this as a data analysis tool to proclaiming that it's a principle that uh, you know, brain dynamics is in principle low dimensional. It happens on low dimensional manifolds like toruses. And uh, the fact that there are millions of neurons involved is just a, a complication that we have to try to suppress and see through. Yeah? Um, this is not the case in the retina. Um, very simple argument. Uh, the human retina has a million neurons as outputs. Uh, retinal processing is organized so that those million neurons are doing more or less different things from each other. They try to avoid being redundant with each other. And so <clears throat> in some sense, the retinal output has a million dimensions and they're irreducible. You can't really you know, claim that uh, the, there is a lower dimensional manifold uh, hidden inside those uh, million dimensions. Um, let me skip this in the interest of time uh, <clears throat> and uh, talk instead about uh, sort of outlook for the future. Um, so, what should we what should we do with the standard model and, and and where to go from here? I think an important thing in the future is to acknowledge the standard model and use it as a reference. So, uh, this can be used to plan new projects. Um, you could, for example, test the basic assumptions of the model. One basic assumption is that the retina gets almost no feedback from the brain, um, <clears throat> which you know, allows us to think about it as a feed-forward system. But is it really true that there are some recent measurements that suggest that, for example, the state of arousal of the animal can have an influence on retinal processing? Uh, I think that's very well worth uh, following up. There are a few optic nerve fibers that go in the opposite direction. And so what do those do in order to modulate the function of the retina? Just one example. Um, you could take the standard model and ask, well, which of the components do we know little about? And for example, there are these wide field amacron cells that send their axons clear across the entire eye. You know, why fundamentally does this side of the eye have to know what the other side of the eye is seeing? I'm not sure. To me, that's still a mystery. Uh, and so there, there are definitely components, of cellular components of the standard model that need to be elaborated. Another thing I think would be 
useful that we should do more of is to sort of be quantitative about the contribution. So uh, <clears throat> if you you know, report the new effect and that effect makes a factor of two difference in how the ganglion cells work under certain conditions, that's remarkable. Yeah, that, that's going to be important. That's going to affect vision and so on. But if it makes a 5% difference, and you know, that's sort of less, less impressive in a way. But I feel like uh, uh, it's, it, it's useful to make reference to the existing state of knowledge and ask, you know, how much, uh, uh, how much uh, are you modifying it? But sort of on the experimental side, uh, I think on the theory side, there is a more, more serious um, uh, open, more serious gap. And uh, I think we need a better theory for why the standard model is what it is. And, and you know, what kind of question is this? Um, so in, in particle physics, you can ask, why are the particles what they are? And very soon the discussion goes into philosophy. You know, people say, oh, it's a result of the Big Bang, and uh, in the future we'll have a big crunch and another Big Bang, and it'll be a different set of particles. We'll be in a different universe. Or maybe there are already a million parallel universes where the standard model is different. Um, <clears throat> in biology, you don't have to become philosophical immediately because there is a sense in which this, this question makes sense. Uh, and that has to do with evolution. Um, so the retina is the way it is because uh, of the outcome of many evolutionary accidents. Uh, genetic variation mutations have varied the parameters of the standard model and uh, other forces like uh, genetic drift or uh, natural selection have led to fixation of some of the parameters. And uh, that's why it is what it is. But um, we need to develop that into a real explanation. And some of you might say, well, we have such a theory, it's efficient coding theory. Uh, the theory says that the retina tries to pack as much information as possible into as few spikes as possible in the retinal ganglion cells. And that explains the processing that happens in the layers of the neurons that lead up to the retinal ganglion cells. And uh, in fact, this theory has been very well developed. It's kind of blossomed in the 1990s and has been followed uh, uh, quite seriously ever since. It makes good predictions. For example, it, uh, you know, early on, it was clear that it would predict the center surround structure of retinal ganglion cell receptive fields. The fact that light in the center excites the neuron and light further away uh, inhibits it. Uh, and similarly, it can predict the uh, human contrast sensitivity curves. We've looked at these data before, sensitivity of humans to light of different spatial frequencies. And some people argue that many other aspects of early psychophysics can be predicted by the same efficient coding theory. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I would say that that really doesn't explain very much about the retina. The main predictions of the theory are center surround receptive fields and the biphasic time course uh, to the temporal sensitivity of uh, neurons. Well, you know, these properties are already developed in the outer retina. Um, bipolar cells have these kinds of receptive fields. And so the question then comes up, uh, why do we need 40 different types of ganglion cells, each of which has the center surround receptive field in order to encode the output from the retina? Uh, with a little bit of uh, arm twisting, you can make the theory uh, explain why there are on and off pathways uh, in the retina, although I'm not totally convinced that it's a very satisfying <laughs> explanation even though I tried it myself. But uh, we really don't understand why there are 40 types of ganglion cells and why they're each specialized in this, these particular ways and uh, report the information along 40 different pathways to the brain. So I think there is a lot of room there for a theory that uh, does better. And uh, in looking for a new theory, I feel we, we should take a bigger viewpoint and ask, uh, you know, what's the purpose, not just of the retina, but of the entire visual system? And uh, I would argue that uh, the purpose of the entire visual system is, you know, to find a needle in a haystack. Um, roughly speaking, the eye gets visual information at a rate of about a gigabit per second. Here's a little back of the envelope calculation to illustrate that. And then the brain that's attached to the eye extracts from that about 10 bits per second. So here's a human typist that uh, 
converts the <clears throat> scrawl of uh, pencil on yellow paper into a manuscript, and she produces letters at an information rate of 10 bits per second. It's generally true that the throughput of human behavior is about 10 bits per second, no matter what we do, but of course we can change what we do from one moment to the next. So the visual system that supports these visually driven behaviors has to find these precious 10 bits per second in this giant junk heap of 10 to the nine bits per second. I think that's the fundamental challenge of the visual system as a whole. The challenge is one of computation. It's not one of efficient coding. Efficient coding theory says you want to maintain the information and just package it differently. That's not what the visual system is trying to do. It's trying to find just a tiny number of bits and throw away all the rest. And so we need to think more about how does the retina throw information away rather than how does it preserve the information and sort of back of the envelope calculation suggests that in fact, the retina passes through only maybe 5% of the information that's present in the cone photoreceptors and discards 95% that you know, gets turned into heat. Uh, into heat. Um, so I, I feel like a better guide to a theory of the retina is going to be focusing on computation rather than coding. And uh, uh, but this is very much an open area. I think that uh, we need to make progress in this in this field. Anyway, that gets me to the end. Let me uh, thank uh, some of the people involved. Uh, uh, my current research the students in my current research group. Uh, some recent graduates are responsible for some of the work that I reviewed, and then recent collaborators that are also steering me into uh, new directions in brain science. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Marcus, for this uh, amazing uh, talk celebrating the success in an overview manner of the retinal neuroscience community and relating it to other fields of uh, brain science. Uh, if uh, I would, I was about to ask you if you could uh, stop screen sharing just so we appear bigger on people's screen. So, given that it's one of the rare opportunities, not maybe not even rare, a single opportunity in the two and a half years that we have been having this assets vision series we mostly focus on uh, vision or retina vertebrate or invertebrate and today we have with us hopefully a much broader audience coming from ai machine learning studying cognition dendrites manifolds and so on it would be amazing if many of you join for this uh, post talk uh, chit chat uh, that is still broadcasted so you can uh, follow the link that i just posted but at some point we will stop broadcasting and continue in the zoom room exclusively there are already a number of questions that uh, appear in the chat and i will uh, start with uh, one that appeared towards the end and generated some hype already so it comes from will kearney how well does the standard model as described here largely feed forward hold up to predictive processing accounts of perception Um, <clears throat> okay, so this is um, a question about uh, predictive coding, um, which um, has so d d different meanings to different people, um, uh, multiple meanings anyway. Uh, so one uh, way it's uh, used is that uh, the idea is that uh, the... Uh, uh, the uh, a given stage of the visual system tries to represent the uh, differences between its input and uh, the prediction that is made by a higher stage of the visual system. So, for example, if some higher stage of the visual system thinks that there's a face in a particular part of the, the, uh, the, the, the visual field, that would be uh, projected down to the earlier stage of the visual system and make it process that, uh, that part of the visual field differently. Um, so obviously, uh, that information, that kind of high level interpretation is unlikely to uh, come back to the retina. Uh, as I mentioned, there are a few optic nerve fibers that go from the brain to the eye, but not enough to uh, uh, deliver sort of high resolution or, or high dimensional information about uh, what's expected in a particular part of the field. On the other hand, <clears throat> the retina itself performs predictive coding in uh, uh, its own uh, low res its own primitive uh, versions. So for example, um, 
you know, uh, lateral inhibition and in particular feedback uh, inhibition is a form of predictive coding. Uh, the surround of the ganglion cell receptive field makes a prediction for what the intensity ought to be in the center. And that prediction gets subtracted from the actual intensity and the ganglion cell re reports the difference. So uh, fundamentally, uh, ganglion cells are differential encoders. They report the difference between the predicted uh, visual scene and the actual visual scene using predictions derived from a simple model of the world, like uh, the world is made of objects and objects have uh, some visual extent. And therefore, I can predict the intensity in this pixel from looking at the surrounding pixels. And similarly, in time, I can predict the intensity now from looking at the intensity earlier because most of the time it doesn't change. So that kind of predictive coding happens within the retina. Uh, I doubt that the retina is tied into any kind of, you know, hierarchical uh, predictive coding uh, uh, structure. Right. Thank you very much for addressing this first question. Uh, and what I inappropriately didn't manage to convey in time is that you have a lot of messages both greeting you at the beginning and thanking you for the talk at the end. And all these messages will be appearing in the YouTube, so in case you want to see them later. Uh, next question, again, uh, going from a general to more specific uh, perspective, is from Matthew Yedutenko. Have you tried to test standard model in a framework of similarity preserving normative theory? I think the short answer is no, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm not I'm not entirely sure I, I understand what theory is being uh, referred to. Um, so Matthew is here with us in the Zoom room already. So Matthew, in case you would yeah. like to clarify, uh, that would be uh, great. If not, I can uh, proceed for the time being with the with the next questions that appeared. Okay, so then I will move to the next question for the time being. Uh, it's one from uh, Jonathan Royce. It's a non-specialist uh, question. And it was like when you were showing the retina overview, like in, with the electronic circuits, and you refer to the bipolar cell uh, non-linearities. And uh, the question is like, what kind of um, behavior, I guess he means like electrotonically speaking, uh, does plasticity and rectification mean in a bipolar uh, synapse? Oh, okay, good point. Um, <clears throat> okay, so rectification refers to the instantaneous input-output function. Um, so <clears throat> output of the neuron is a function of input of the neuron, and it typically has a kind of a threshold, uh, you know, the machine learning people would call it the ReLU uh, relationship, where uh, below a threshold there is uh, very little output, and above the threshold it increases linearly. Um, for some neurons, we also have to include saturation because they can only increase their output uh, up to a certain level. And if uh, stimuli or inputs are very strong, then you get, in addition to the uh, threshold uh, behavior, you also get saturation at the top. So that's what uh, I mean by rectification. It's the instantaneous relationship between input and output. Um, plasticity or adaptation refers to a change in that relationship over time. So for example, if we, let's take the uh, ReLU simplification where the nonlinearity is just a, a threshold followed by a linear function. Um, <clears throat> if the neuron has been very active for some time, the gain of that nonlinearity will, uh, will uh, decrease. So the output uh, becomes less sensitive to the input. Uh, if the neuron is silent for some time, uh, it recovers and the gain increases again. So that's what's meant by plasticity or adaptation is a time dependent and an activity dependent change in the gain of the relationship. The rectification refers to the relationship itself having this kind of non threshold nonlinearity. And staying on the computational aspects of your uh, talk, the next question is from uh, Madine Sarvestani. Why does X not being relevant for explaining and coding variants in the retina mean it's not relevant for the rest of the visual system with its recurrence, multimodality, and six-layered structure? <laughs> okay. Uh, I didn't mean to imply that. Uh, we, we, can't take, we cannot take the retina as a... Um, uh, as as uh, extending to the rest of the brain. Um, so um, 
if, if I if, if I say that, um, uh, for example, uh, full blown compartmental modeling was not necessary to understand the retina, that doesn't mean that it doesn't play a role anywhere else. It does mean that there's an existence proof that you can explain fairly complex phenomena without it. And so it might encourage people working on you know, the cerebellum or the insect mushroom body or something like that to uh, wonder, you know, uh, can, let's at least try to see what can be done without assuming that the individual neurons are hyper complex computing engines. Uh, can we actually capture the phenomena with a simpler model of, of single neurons? Yeah. It, uh, it does not exclude that more complex models of single neurons are necessary in, in other cases, but I feel like uh, mm, there, there is sort of a tendency to, to think that, uh, oh, the brain is the most complex object in the universe, uh, all these fantastic functions of cognition, uh, it has to trace down to uh, you know the complexity of uh, the single neurons, and and I feel like uh, our experience in the retina has been that even with uh, sing simple single neuron models, and not a terrible amount of complexity of circuitry, you can explain a lot of phenomena that uh, you know seemed puzzling uh, to begin with. Thank you very much for that. Before I continue with the next questions that appear, I have one of my own. So you mentioned uh, retinal neuroscience success as a community, right? That we are doing at least 80% uh, of explained variants, and this would be celebrated. Um, my question goes now to vision restoration. And there, like we have many attempts, like with, electro with electronic uh, implants or biological or introducing some options and so on. But I guess we are not at the same stage of success. And I know that this is relative, like for someone that is blind, even being able to see some shades, it's already a huge, huge success. Uh, but why do you think this field is still, like compared to the physiology of retina, it's still at, at its infancy? Like, is it because we don't have a mature understanding? Is it because we lack the equipment to restore vision or somewhere in between? Um. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I think it's not a lack of understanding the retina. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's everything to do with uh, uh, getting access to neural signals uh, that to get sent to the brain. Um, I mean, uh, <clears throat> uh, when I started in, in this field, uh, uh, people began to implant electrode arrays in eyes uh with the idea that uh, after the photoreceptors have degenerated you can then stimulate the ganglion cells directly and send pulses through the optic nerves to the brain and make the brain uh you know give the brain the illusion that the uh the, the eye is still working and um i don't know to me it always seemed like a far-fetched uh, uh idea technologically speaking just because you know, you put a grain of sand in the eye, the retina shrivels around it, and uh, uh, how, how do you keep that from happening? And, and uh, you know, we're not pretty sure that that's not going to work. Uh, you know, a company was founded around that idea. Several companies have been founded around that idea, uh, have actually implanted electrode arrays in the eyes of patients. Uh, patients never uh, emerged from blindness. Um, and uh, uh, and now the company has gone bankrupt, and uh, people are stuck with these things in their eyes, and nobody there to service them. So it's uh, kind of a, an example of uh, technology failure. Yeah, um, I think there are much more promising avenues um, to vision restoration, uh, but they're not they're not implemented yet. Right. So uh, you know, one obviously is. Uh, uh, you know, stem cell therapy of some kind, getting uh, rods to reform and integrate into the circuit after, uh, or you know, ideally before rod degeneration happens uh, completely. I think the optogenetic approach is very cool. Um, you know, putting uh, transducers into uh, renal ganglion cells or even earlier neurons like bipolar cells and driving them directly with light after the photoreceptors have died. Um, I think the, there are clinical studies ongoing, and I think that's a very promising direction. Um, <clears throat> uh, in our own lab, we've, we've tried a different approach. So 
Okay, so the, let's back up for a moment. Uh, the challenge is that, um, uh, refers to my last slide, uh, the retina gets about 10 to the 9 bits per second of information going into it, uh, into the photoreceptors, and the human being ultimately needs 10 bits of that. Yeah. So these uh, retinal approaches to vision restoration are trying to feed information into the eye at the rate of 10 to the 9 bits per second. Uh, they're, they're trying to, you know, uh, reconstitute the flow of information at the input. And um, that just seems very hard to me. It uh, seems, seems very hard to build a brain machine interface that uh, can operate at, uh, at that kind of bandwidth. And you might say, okay, 1% of that might be good enough, but uh, it's still a lot of bandwidth that is needed. And fundamentally, the retinal implant company failed because of the lack of bandwidth. Um, so why not uh, take the opposite approach, which is to give the person the 10 bits per second they're looking for. Um, and so, for example, you know, for reading, that, that problem has been solved, right? You have uh, text-to-speech text uh, devices that uh, will read what's, what's on the screen for you, and you can uh, get that information as quickly as if you were reading it with your eyes. And so our thought was, uh, can you read the rest of the world as well? Uh, can we turn the visual scene into uh, an audio representation that uh, tells the, the viewer, so to speak, what is out there without requiring uh, the visual parts of the brain? Um, and so personally, I think that's uh, an avenue that ought to be pursued more. We should communicate with the brain at the 10 bits per second that it needs in order to function, not at the one gigabit per second. And then hoping that the visual system will correctly sift that out again <laughs> so that it gets only the 10 bits per second that it needs. Uh, and I feel like uh, the kind of assistive technology uh, that exists now, uh, you know, fantastic tools for automatic image recognition and uh, interpreting the contents of images and annotating in real time, 60 times a second. Uh, we need to make use of all the, the clever machine learning and AI tools that have been developed in that area and uh, make prostheses that work at the cognitive level uh, rather than trying to reconstitute the basic uh, neural signals of, uh, of the retina. Right, the encoding itself. Uh, thank you very much for this detailed uh, response, Marcus. And I will be taking one last question that appears in the chat before stopping the live broadcast. So I would like to thank our audience as well for being here and uh, ask them if they want to be part, like as an audience or actively participate in the ongoing conversation to make sure to follow the link I will repost uh, right now. So the last question I will be taking from the chat is from uh, Philip Bartel. Uh, generally, what aspects of the message change when the activity of the neuron changes? Is the form of the message changed somehow, or is it always only the value? Um, I'm, I'm a bit unclear about the question. Could you just repeat it? And maybe yeah, I'll... of course. So I'm repeating word by word. Generally, what aspects of the message change when the activity of the neuron changes? Is the form of the message changed somehow, or is it always only the value that changes? I don't know if this is hinting at the latency and coding, or if it's just like spike, like this distinction. Okay, all right. Um, so uh, the, I think the question might get at, what is it about the ganglion cell spike trains that actually conveys information to the brain? Yeah, and uh, this is a, an old question, and it uh, uh, not only uh, in the case of the retina, but in general, people have been contemplating what is the neural code, what uh, what uh, is it about the spike trains that uh, is important to downstream regions of the brain, um, and uh, uh, there there are you know kind of uh, two extreme views of uh, opinions on this. Uh, one is that uh, the only thing that really matters is the number of spikes that the neuron fires over some period of time, let's say a tenth of a second, and so we can <clears throat> summarize the message that a, a neuron like a ganglion cell conveys by just uh, listing the firing rate averaged over, let's say, a tenth of a second. Um, the other extreme view is that no, every spike is sacred. Uh, every spike has its own uh, message to convey. 
and it's the precise timing of those spikes that uh, is important for uh, uh, downstream visual processing. Um, I feel like uh, in the visual system, we probably have a better understanding of, uh, of these, uh, at least the constraints on these theories than uh, in the, some, some other parts. So for example, uh, some aspects of visual perception are incredibly fast. Uh, there are uh, decisions you can make, you know, maybe not consciously, but uh, nonetheless that you make within a tenth of a second of uh, the uh, visual input or two tenths of a second. And uh, if you ask, uh, how does the visual signal proceed through different stages of the brain, you know, starting with four receptors, several synapses to retinal ganglion cells, several more synapses to, uh, through the visual cortex, uh, it's clear that uh, uh, the neurons along the way cannot be counting many spikes. Uh, they have to operate on either single spikes or just a few spikes. Uh, there is no time for the system to calculate the firing rate of uh, neurons. Yeah. And uh, so as a result, there's been a lot of interest, I think, in the taking single spikes seriously in uh, the output of the retina and also, of course, in subsequent stages of uh, uh, the visual system because uh, they are probably involved in at least some very early uh, steps of visual processing that uh, might be performed just based on one spike per neuron. Thank you very much once again, uh, Marcus, for uh, addressing all these uh, questions. And thank you very much to the audience that was uh, here with us today. I will be stopping the live broadcast right now. So if anyone was shy until now and already in the room, you can um, start your video because we are going uh, offline. Thank you very much.